Back with us, our criminal, great criminal defense attorney, Jeff Gold, and we're waiting for Gypsy to take the stand. Okay, that, we can expect that again, right? That's what she's going to say. That this, we did, there was no future plan when Michelle was alive. Right, but that's baloney. I mean, again, whether or not this overcomes the lack of a cause of death, who knows? But it's baloney, and it's going to sound like baloney because, look, he moved her in within weeks after the death. He was talking ab about being single. All these things indicate that she was fundamental to him, not just something on the side that just happened to be there. Otherwise, he'd be grieving about his wife, and he wouldn't be thinking about her at all. So it it belies the truth. Clearly, she was important to him, whether she was the the most motive or the cause, who knows, but it's not believable that she was just somebody on the side because otherwise he'd be grieving. You know, and let's get back to something we talked about a couple of moments ago. Let's illuminate it further. The roommates, Gypsy's roommate saying she was talking about getting Michelle out of the way, right. cutting the brake lines, and they had to tell her, uh, Jillian, Gypsy, there could be kids in the car here. Yeah, I mean, you know, shades of Jody Arias. I mean, you know, that stuff makes you crazy. Who knows? Maybe she put all this in the mind of Dr. McNeil. Maybe it was all her idea. Uh, who knows? But uh, when she gets up on the stand, there'll be a test. I don't know if it's going to be anywhere near as dramatic as the testimony of the daughter, Rachel, was yesterday. But certainly we're all waiting for it because she is a linchpin here. If she was believable that she would, this was not a serious affair and that she was merely, you know, something on the side, maybe that would matter. Again, all this comes in uh, opposition to the fact that there's a great lack in the state's case as to whether they can prove cause of death. So this is what the state has. It has to put on all this circumstantial evidence. That's all the state has. All right. Again, the, the, the mistress, Gypsy Willis, is set to take the stand any moment. We're going to have it for you. That courtroom is packed. Uh, basically, if what we, it sounds like it's gypsy mania there in the courtroom <laughs> in Utah. We'll have it for you. Jeff, hang tight. also want to get to this each week. The prosecution can redirect on what the defense asks. I want to make sure we got this legally correct for that. We go to our one man justice squad. He's Jeff Goldcrape, criminal defense attorney. Is that what you're gathering as well, Jeff? Am I missing anything there? No, you're not missing anything. The judge really found that uh, uh, because originally the child testified with something like 40 times, I don't know, and some inconsistencies, that the very detailed statements later seem to be coaching, tainted. That's what the judge was saying. And in essence, it's very difficult to cross-examine a child witness anyway without looking as a defense attorney like you're an idiot. You know, you're, you're, you don't want to beat up a child, especially whose mom is dead. Uh, so the judge uh, split the baby, so to speak, and allows testimony as to the statement given close in time to the event, about a year, still not that close, but a year, as opposed to saying now, this is what I remember today, because the judge found that most likely, and actually by a preponderance of the evidence, that the child had probably been coached, tainted in those hmm. uh, uh, interceding years. And so it's a little difficult for the parties because they have to stick to the statement. And witnesses, especially children witnesses, don't exactly understand the legal niceties. You're only supposed to talk about a statement. They may be asked a question and answer in the present tense as to what they remember now. So we'll see. It's a bit of a minefield. And the judge, in essence, said that the probative value of the testimony she would give today is outweighed by the prejudicial effect that those years with mm. Alexis, who doesn't like her father, yep. may have uh, uh, engendered. Who wins? You think that one side clearly wins? Uh, I think the defense wins because the state wanted to get it all in. I think in, in many jurisdictions, the state would have got the whole testimony in and allowed cross-examination to work its magic. Uh, but here, the judge found, uh, as he was entitled to do under the facts of this case, uh, that it was too prejudicial. I I'm not so uh, sure that it's uh, the right ruling, but definitely it's, it's a defense ruling. Got it. Okay. All right. And... One of our producers, Jim, has uh, sent me some highlights. He's looked at that interview and some of the things we can look for when this is played in court. Again, she's seven years old, and she's talking about her favorite cartoon is SpongeBob. And, uh, and that was to make sure she can tell the difference between pretend and reality. She's talking about her mom saying that 